Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. I'm super excited to have on our guest is Laura K. Connell. She's a trauma-informed author and a coach who shares a fresh, compassionate approach to overcoming family dysfunction and healing self-sabotage. Her guest articles have reached millions of people, and now she's making a full scope of her transformative insights available to everybody in her upcoming book. It's called It's Not Your Fault. Laura also teaches a step-by-step -step strategy or strategies to set boundaries and stop self-abandonment. Thank you so much, Laura, for being with us today. Thanks, Carolyn. I'm really happy to be here. So tell us more about yourself, your journey, and how you arrived at where you are today. And of course, let's talk about your new book so folks can get some insight. Sure. So my journey starts with growing up in a very dysfunctional family. So this was characterized by both emotional abuse and neglect. And the emotional abuse was mostly on my mother's side. She had some sort of undiagnosed mental illness um, because it hasn't been diagnosed. It can't say exactly what it is, but definitely narcissistic tendencies maybe some borderline personality in there, but whatever it was, it really made her extremely emotionally dysregulated, very lacking in empathy or compassion for her children or anyone else for that matter. Just not able to think sort of outside of herself or see the world outside of herself or to put herself in someone else's shoes. So as you can imagine, very difficult to parent effectively when you're coming from that place. And then my father was emotionally neglectful. So sort of there in body, but not any other way. These people were not people I could go to for help. And so very early on, I developed some coping strategies to sort of raise myself essentially. And what I say in the book is that these coping strategies are actually the self-sabotage that we, we deal with as adults. So the ways we try to protect ourselves as children are actually um, looking like self-defeating strategies as adults. So even though you think you're not on your own side, you are. It's just that it's kind of an immature way of dealing with life because we never learned the proper ways. If you grew up in a home like mine, you had parents who weren't capable of teaching you how to get through life. You tried to figure it out yourself as a child. And this is what, this is your toolbox. This is all you have, right? You're just trying to get by. So that's basically the kind of childhood I had and where the self-sabotage came from, which of course, inspired me to write the book, which is about healing self-sabotage. And I started healing my self-sabotage in a serious way after my divorce. So because of the family I grew up in, I married into a family that was also very dysfunctional. I see now I married a man who was emotionally neglectful in the same way my father was, not capable of giving love because of what he grew up with. He developed what we call an avoidant attachment disorder or style. So he was very distancing. I never had true intimacy with him, even though we were married for over 10 years. We had two children together. That just true connection was never, ever there. And that's because of his upbringing and mine, because of my upbringing that I would be attracted to that. You know, so after that divorce, I believe I got the time and space to actually look at myself because, and I think part of it may have been too, that I always had the excuse of the bad marriage to explain why my life wasn't working. So then after I get divorced, I'm on my own and I'm still dealing with the same self-sabotaging things, including an addiction to alcohol. Then I really started to look at it. And I started to educate myself, you know, I started to get really honest about the dysfunction in my family, because a lot of it, and some people will relate to this, a lot of it is that we try to hide the truth about our family, because we're so used to doing that. So instead of 
you know, looking out for ourselves, we're always abandoning ourselves in order to protect the family image. Mm -hmm. And there is a lot of social stigma from about coming from a dysfunctional family. So you also are kind of embarrassed about it a little bit. You think people are going to judge you. And so I hid that for a long time. And when I finally decided to admit it, like, yes, it was extremely dysfunctional. That's not my fault. This is where my problems are stemming from. And then I started to read, you know, from psychologists like Bessel van der Kolk and um, Gabor Mate and see that they concurred that a childhood like this is going to lead to extreme self-defeating behaviors as an adult and that this is where it's coming from. So I have to deal with the root issue instead of just dealing with the behaviors and beating myself up because of the way I'm behaving. And so even going to therapy had never really helped me because the style of therapy I was given or the modalities they used were really treating the behavior. So it really was in essence telling me this is your fault. So even though they might have not said it that way, mm. it really was you need better habits. You need more willpower D change the way you think. There's a lot of that to change the way you think. Whereas um, really we need to get in there. Sometimes it's a somatic issue, like your nervous system has gone awry and get to the bottom of where this comes from, really understand why you're doing it. For me, that was the first step and that's where it all started. I started sharing my journey on social media in a blog that kind of brought an audience to me. And that's where I was able to finish writing the book and get the book deal and all of that. So hopefully that gives you a good idea. Yeah, it does. Um, Let's narrow some of that down, though. How did you sabotage yourself? Like, what did were you a people pleaser? Um, you know, did you just suffer from anxiety, negative thoughts? Was it all of the above? Like, let's narrow it down. Yeah, it was all of the above. I really had very few healthy coping strategies simply because I had never been taught any. I was really in my family of origin. I like to say I came out of it like a feral cat. Like I just had no skills. Nothing was ever taught to me. And everything I did was sort of a defense against the threats that were coming my way. And the threats were not physical because I wasn't physically abused. The threats were of rejection and of abandonment mm. because I could see my parents were so often not happy with me. And the very fact of my existence seemed to displease them so much. And so that's actually surprisingly common in dysfunctional families that children have this deep fear of rejection and abandonment by the parent who is the primary caregiver, the one you are dependent on, and the one that it feels like you're going to die if they don't love you. And so this is where, like you mentioned, people pleasing, which is the root of having poor boundaries. So when we're people pleasing, we're not setting boundaries for ourselves, because we sort of care more about what other people think of us than we do about getting our own right. needs met. So that was a huge one for me. And I felt like, and I couldn't have said this at the time, but after the work I've done and the research and all that stuff, I know now that setting boundaries felt like life or death because I had transferred that feeling of fear of rejection by my parents. I transferred that to all the adults in my life as well. So there was something kind of encoded in my body because I felt it on a nervous system level. Like if your listeners might know the feeling of trying to set a boundary and their voice shakes or they might shake or they just feel this feeling of wanting to run away or they just think, let's just get through this one time so I can be safe, even though logically, you know, if you don't set the boundary now, it's going to cause you more trouble down the line. Mm. The nervous system and the inner child that is running all this programming doesn't think long term, they think, keep her safe right now or keep him safe right now. What do I need to do? And that looks like people pleasing, because yeah. the erroneous thought is, I'm going to die if they don't like me, right? 
How many years mm-hmm. ago did you start your journey of, of self healing? Yeah, it's been a long one, but it's also had, it's been incremental, I suppose. So I think I really started when I was still in the marriage around 2008 or so. And this started with just a spiritual journey of reading people like Eckhart Tolle Mm -hmm. and Marianne Williamson, Mm -hmm. and just kind of getting a more enlightened view of what life was about, because I had been so focused on defending myself against these perceived threats, because the world to me was just a series of obstacles to kind of protect myself against because of the way I'd been raised. So trying to get an outlook on life that was more kind of on a higher plane than just Mm -hmm. the earthly plane. I hadn't been raised with any religion, so I didn't really know a lot about God or anything like that. So I started with these kind of enlightened teachers. And from there, I went into, um, you know, that kind of stirring in me made me see what was going on in my marriage at the time and really see clearly that things aren't going to change. And if I want to get my needs met, I'm probably going to have to leave. And so the marriage started to deteriorate. And it's not that I, I kind of all of a sudden got this information and said, I have to leave. I really wanted the marriage to work. I really believe in marriage. I still do. And I really wanted it to work, but it was, it became quite evident that my ex was not willing to change. He wasn't willing to look at any of this stuff. And I probably didn't have the coping skills to help him or invite him into that to take my responsibility for it, you know? So that led to, of course, the marriage breakdown. And then I would say after the marriage broke down, it really gave me the chance to look at the alcohol addiction. So I was struggling with an alcohol addiction, which was another coping mechanism I picked up in early adulthood, really late childhood, like 17, I started to drink. And it wasn't that I drank alcoholically that whole time, but it was sort of intermittent. Like if I was dealing with challenges, I would go to alcohol to sort of Mm. feel better because I didn't know how else to deal with it. It became too much. And alcohol started to be the only way I could relax, you know? So it was, I was dependent on it in that way. So getting out of the marriage and having the realization with no one to enable me, because my drinking was very enabled by the family around me. They didn't want to face problems. So being on my own with this alcohol problem and seeing like, no, I need to deal with this. This is really an issue for me. I can't stop. And so that led me into a recovery program. So that's kind of another leg of my healing journey. And then from there, just kind of delving into, you know, educating myself about the dysfunctional family stuff. Um, learning, like doing true education, like a degree in psychology and things like that. And um, just finding out as much as I could about why I was doing what I was doing and where it came from. Because so you did, you did get a degree. degree. You got a degree in psychology. I do have a degree. Yeah, um, I do have an undergraduate degree. Yes. And then I have um, a coaching certification in uh, like trauma informed coaching as well. So, um, yeah, now, now I and noticed knowing... in, in your book, you mentioned something really profound. Um, you said that most of us spend so much time reacting, um, and surviving rather than creating the life that we love. Why do you think we do that? Do you, do you think the majority of people live that way? Because I think most of us have why, oh, well, probably everybody has some type of dysfunction. Nobody's perfect mm-hmm. mentally or physically, right? So why do you think we do that? Why do you think we spend most of our time reacting and surviving rather than channeling that into the life that we love? Yeah, I think it's because that's all we know. So if you do grow up in a dysfunctional home, And like you said, most of us do, but there are different levels of dysfunction. So I'm, I'm sort of talking about a dysfunctional home where 
You are not encouraged to explore the world and figure out who you are. You may not receive a lot of praise and encouragement. Um, you may think that love is something that you have to strive for and be perfect in order to receive. And at the same time, you may not ever receive it. So it may feel like something you can never have. So that type of home where it, it really is very rejecting, I guess is what I'm saying. And so when you grow up in a rejecting home like that, you feel like you don't have the support that you need to thrive because you don't, it's true, you don't. And so you go out into the world with this nervous system that has been thrown into fight or flight over and over again, because the people that you should be going to for support and comfort, they are not giving you that. And so instead, they're giving you rejection, contempt, the sense that you're a burden or you're too much, your little nervous system is feeling that as a life or death situation, life or death makes the fight or flight response go off, which releases all this cortisol, which is very hard on you, feels terrible, and makes you feel like you are fighting to survive. So you go into the world with this um, overactivated nervous system that's usually in a defensive mode. And it makes it very hard to relax because the part of us that is designed to help us relax is deactivated when the fight or flight is in motion. Mm -hmm. And so if you're spending most of your time in that fight or flight, you're never able to relax. And another thing is that the brain gets rewired in these situations so that it is actually almost impossible to relax. And that if you're not in a state of trauma or chaos, you feel almost as though you don't exist. Mm. And this is one of the reasons why narcissists um, like my mother will create chaos and they call it um, getting their supply. You may have heard of narcissistic supply. So that is what they need to kind of feel alive because the emptiness that you experience when you're at rest or when your brain is not kind of flooded with all these negative thoughts um, is kind of intolerable. And you may not understand why you can be kind of sitting there trying to relax and all of a sudden negative thoughts will come in. That's one of the reasons. It's actually just helping you remember that you're here, you know, yeah, that yeah. you're alive. Kind so, of. <laughs> so is there a way, um, does your book help explain, because a lot of people don't want to do the work. Like they, they see a book and it's got so much instructions and information and people just don't want to be bothered with it. But it's so important to understand that connection between what's happening to us biologically and emotionally. How does your book help us resolve that? Is it easy steps mm -hmm. to follow? Is it some mm -hmm. triggers that we need to, to deactivate? Like, could you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Um, the great thing about my book and what I think makes it very different, I was kind of prompted to write it because of what I've been through, like I said, but also because I didn't see anything on the market for self-sabotage that didn't mainly deal with behavior modification or thought control. And that had never worked for me long-term. It worked short-term, but it, it didn't do it for the long-term because it didn't create a change in me or a transformation. It just sort of worked as long as I was policing myself and then I would just fall back into the old patterns again is if I wasn't sort of acting perfectly and following all these instructions on how to behave, I would just go back to being myself because myself hadn't changed. It was just the behavior that changed. So what I offer is strategies or steps, if you call them, but they go much deeper than the behavior. They really go to the self who you are and where you're operating from on a very deep level. And these are things like healing the inner child. So all those coping mechanisms I talked about at the beginning that the child adopts, like the people pleasing you mentioned, um, even an inner critic that comes in because that's all you know. And you might believe that the inner critic is actually helping you motivate you when 
that's absolutely not true. Being kind to yourself is going to be much better for motivating you. So it is healing that inner child. And so the inner child is the one who believes that you're not safe. And so it rushes in to save your life with the very um, short-sighted measures that we've been talking about today that actually sabotage you in the long run. And these measures that they think keep you safe include addictions and they include dropping the boundaries and they include even perfectionism, you know, or um, what else? Procrastination even. They include hiding, not speaking up for yourself, even at work. So if you're at work in a meeting and you don't speak up, that's your inner child saying it's safer to be quiet because in my home, remember, if I showed up, I got punished, I got in trouble. So it's it's realizing that the reason you're doing these all started in childhood. So let's deal with the inner child who believes you're not safe. How can we make that inner child feel safe? Well, what we do is we reassure the child that you are the adult now, and it is no longer in danger. So being rejected by someone, we're not going to lie and say that setting a boundary is not going to cause rejection, because it might. And that's why we set the boundary, we want to keep people out who are not good for us, right. And so that's another thing, a lot of the self help out there, kind of, it lies a little bit, because it makes it as though setting boundaries and is going to be all good. It's going to be all wonderful. But the fact is, setting boundaries can feel very bad. It can make you feel very guilty. It can make you feel like a bad person. But the truth is, it's still the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. Even though it doesn't feel good for us, it's still the right thing to do. So it's almost like as an adult, it's like self discipline. So instead of doing the easy thing, you're going to do the thing that's going to help you in the long run, even though it might be painful right now. That's what adults do. And that's what you have to teach the inner child. I'm the adult. And you can even prove it with the fact that you're taking care of yourself. You have your own home, perhaps you own a car, maybe you have a job, perhaps you do put your own food in your mouth, you shop for your own groceries, you are clothing yourself, you know, however you do that, you do have access to resources that you didn't have when you were a child. So even if you don't have all the answers yourself, you can ask someone else, you couldn't really do that when you were a child, you know, or you can read about it, you can Google it, whatever, you can take care of things, and you can find a way to deal with these issues in a healthy, mature way. And it's really important to know too, that the inner child is not against you. It's important to know that there's no part of you that is not on your side. Every part of you is trying to help you. It's just they do it in ways that don't look like they help and they don't mm. feel like they help. So thank the inner child for the work that it's done to keep you safe so far and just say, you know, now I want to take care of you. You've taken care of me all this time. I want to take care of you. And I want you now your job is going to be, why don't you find something fun for us to do? You know, maybe you haven't had a lot of fun because your inner child has been tasked with um, just taking care of these imagined or real threats. Right. So now inner child, I'm not going to discard you. I just need you to have a different job here because I'm taking care of things. So there's one example. So regardless of your age, that inner child always will need reckoning or healing at some point if you're suffering from these debilitating things, right? So it doesn't mm -hmm. matter if you're 20, 30 or 70, right? Um, right? So so someone that's older, say, and that has suffered, you know, a lifetime of of what we've been talking about, is it more difficult for them to, to heal or is the process like the same for somebody that suffered decades? Yeah, that's a very good question. And most of my clients are over the age of 50 or at least over the age of late 40s. And I would say absolutely not. And I think one of the fears of older people doing this work is that they think, 
I've lost all this time. I've wasted all these years, almost like what's the point? Correct. But what I want to get across is that just because you feel like you wasted all those years, it's not going to take you that many years to get back your life, if that makes sense. So if you feel like you wasted 30 years, it is not going to take you 30 years to get to help, <laughs> you know? It might take a couple, it might just take a couple of years, you know, and um, so very quickly when you decide to do this work and you really focus on it and you make the commitment to yourself, because often the most difficult thing to do is actually to commit to putting yourself first. That's not something a lot of us are used to. And even just doing that can be so hard. But and you deal with the guilt and all of that stuff, but you got to do it anyway. And once you commit to that, healing will come extraordinarily quickly. So and all those years that you lost, they won't really seem as bad as they do now, because the years that you have ahead of you are going to be so meaningful and so fruitful and really aligned with what you were actually put on this earth to do and to enjoy and to accomplish. So when it comes to toxic people, because many, many times they're our own family members and close friends, um, I, I would imagine that part of this healing would be to kind of disassociate yourself from them or exclude them from your life entirely. Um, how did you mm -hmm. deal with that? Did you have a lot of toxic people around you that you just said, I, I can't, I can't do this anymore? Like, because I think mm -hmm. that's a big problem is that a lot of this comes from people that are closest to us. Yeah, that is a huge problem. And for myself, I have, I don't want to say I've gone no contact with family members, but I'm quite estranged from my family. And, and that was because I didn't feel that I could sort of have the authentic life that I wanted to have with that influence on me. I tried very hard. I did everything I could to um, enable that. But eventually I had to come to the realization that if I want the life that's authentic to me, where I'm doing what I meant to do in this world and I'm feeling good about myself, I can't have those negative influences. And so that's where I'm at right now. Um, and a lot of people who come to me are very fretful about the idea of going no contact with family. And they will often say things like, I don't want to be the type of person who does that, which if you look at that statement, it really is judging yourself from the outside. Mm -hmm. You know, you're saying that type of person, and you're really distancing yourself from yourself. And you're kind of putting yourself in this category that's very negative. And I think that comes from this societal stigma attached to going no contact with your family or not having a good relationship with your family. And one of the lies I would say is that if you are the one who's not getting along with your family or you are the one who's detached, you're the common denominator, you're the problem. But that is a very convenient way for the family to continue in their dysfunction because often the one who detaches is the truth teller. They are the ones who have the insight. They are very interested in getting to the bottom of the dysfunction. They want to heal the family. Often people I work with have a strong desire for the family to heal. Mm -hmm. And I have to convince them and they have to come to believe that they don't have the power to do that. You know, we don't have the power to heal our families. We only have the power to heal ourselves. And that sometimes affects a change in other people, but often it does not because the dysfunctional family is really not interested in anyone's insight. It's interested in keeping things the way they are. They will do almost anything to keep the status quo mm. because they're so afraid of change. Right. I think they're very frightened of maybe what's going to be exposed or what's on the other side of that change. They don't know what they can't see. And so avoiding change is really what the family is set up to do. And so they'll put you in this role of what they call scapegoat. 
So pointing at you as the problem to avoid dealing with their own problems. So if that's the type of family that you're in, no contact sometimes is the only option. Um, but I will say that the fretfulness that people feel around deciding whether to, to go no contact when they first start working with me, mm-hmm. once you do the healing in yourself, you will begin to get more clarity on whether you need to do that or not. So it's not going to feel like a black or white decision. It will come it'll just feel something that you have to do for yourself and you might have more solutions come up. So the little child that we're healing is um, black and white, you know, it thinks in black and white, it thinks this or this, it doesn't think of all the other options that might be available to you, or it doesn't think that maybe no contact won't be forever. Maybe it's just a short time while I Mm. heal. Maybe I just need a year to focus on myself Um, so it's so used to being punished for any decision that it makes for its own good that it can't believe that this is possible without huge punishment or ramification, but it is possible. And the key is to understand that you are not going to get the validation that you want from your family. That's really got to come from inside of you. You won't get it from society. You won't get it from anyone else. You really have to have it um, within yourself. And as you do this so work, true. you will begin to, yeah, you will begin to love yourself. What type of people do self-sabotagers attract? What's the the typical like characteristics or personality traits? Uh, I think it depends on the type of self-sabotage that you have, but A common form of self-sabotage would be, um, say, like an an anxious attachment style, and that would correlate with the people-pleasing that we were talking about before. So if you're someone who really self-abandons and puts other people's needs ahead of your own, you will attract someone who would readily take advantage of that, right? Mm -hmm. And you might also attract, say, in a romantic relationship, you would attract someone who is avoidant attachment style, who will create distancing strategies, which make you, when I say that, it means like, um, you know, as soon as things start to get close, they will go become workaholics, like get really involved with their work or they'll have a hobby that takes up all of their time or if you want a hug, they can't give it to you. They withhold affection, things like that. Right. So that's an example. And I see that in my old marriage and even relationships that came after that, the sense because of the way my father was with me of being a burden to him or him just not being there for me, feeling like I was always trying to get his attention, Mm. never receiving it, only receiving criticism. So of course, it makes sense that I would have love and striving and never getting as intertwined. So, so you attracted feel, like you attracted what was familiar to you, in other words. Yes, yes. And I started to see something that was very revealing and which um other women or men might relate to. And that's a feeling of strong chemistry towards someone who is avoidant or unavailable, as we like to say, Um, feeling even meeting someone who is kind of detached, or making it very evident that they're not going to give you the attention you want and feeling a strong physical want for them, you know, like the, the chemistry that we talk about in romance that we think is a green light, but can often be a red flag. Mm. If you have strong chemistry towards someone who is really not even giving you the time of day, or maybe they're making it clear that they only want sex or something like that. um, You need to look at that and see where is that coming from? You know, why is that feeling familiar? And you might find that, oh, this was like my dad. He didn't give me the attention I wanted. And I was always trying to get it. So love for me feels like striving for attention and never getting it. Huh? You know, like you just want to look at those things. Mm-hmm. So tell us 
more about how your book can help folks, you know, discover how to heal the the inner child and discover how to truly mm-hmm. love yourself. Like, do you go through a yeah. step-by-step process with them? Like, I know you do coaching as well. So how do the two work together if they do? Yeah. Yeah. That self-love piece that we've been talking about and healing the inner child. There is a modality that I love called mindful self-compassion. And this is something that has actually been researched quite recently. So back in the days when I was getting that therapy that started in the 90s and really didn't address my deeper issues. Now we have some newer research in psychology that actually does go deeper to those issues and it doesn't only deal with the surface and mindful self-compassion is one of those things. And so what mindful self-compassion does is it helps you to find that um, healing love for yourself based on three different components. And the first is self-kindness, which is is just like what it sounds. It's just treating yourself as kindly as you treat other people. So you might think about, well, how would I treat a friend who came to me with a problem or a challenge? Um, What would that look like? And you can even write a letter of, you know, what you would say to them if they came to you with something. And you think about what you would say to a friend, you would say you would be encouraging, right? You would Mm -hmm. say, well, yeah, or you might even say that really sucks, but you can deal with it and I will help you or um, it's not your fault. You're okay. Like this is just a mistake you made. What have you? So you're having empathy, sympathy, compassion, basically. Yes. And then think honestly about how you talk to yourself when you have a similar issue, when you have a challenge in your life, or maybe if you fell short in some way, you didn't reach a goal or you made a mistake or something. How do you talk to yourself? And I'm going to guess that there is a marked difference between how you talk to yourself and how you talk to a friend. Mm. And often we say to ourselves, and it is harsh, it is you're so stupid, you know, like you did it again. Why can't you do anything right? Why do you keep doing the same things over again? What's your problem? What's the matter with you? And even worse, like we really do speak to ourselves in ways that we would never, ever talk to someone else. Mm -hmm. And, and we should be speaking to ourselves the most encouraging because we're the most important person in our lives, right? So it starts there, very simple, just to start being nicer to yourself. And then um, the second part of it is just knowing that you're not alone. So they call it common humanity. And this is the knowledge that whatever you are going through, someone else and probably many more people are going through the same thing. And that includes just a general feeling of suffering, which is very human. So I have studied, you know, Buddhist psychology, and this self-compassion comes out of Buddhism because of the mindfulness component. So um, it's knowing that suffering is human. You suffering is not a sign of weakness. All it means is that you're a human being. And really what matters is how you cope with it, right? So instead of isolating when you're feeling a challenge or you feel like maybe you let yourself down or something, mm-hmm. you're going to you're gonna think other people are feeling this way and that's going to help you reach out to get the help that you want. And one example I use is that in my own life, when I was drinking to excess, I hid that. I isolated myself with that. So when you're hiding something, there is no way to get help. There is no recovery from something that you're hiding, right? Mm. So when you can say other people are dealing with this, let me reach out to them and then recovery will come quickly as it did for me. It came so quickly when I just stopped hiding it, you know? So there's another component, just knowing that. So so your self-awareness. Well, you were fortunate because that doesn't happen for a lot of people. They get so wrapped up in drinking and they just destroy their their lives and those of their loved ones. So whether it's drinking or drug, but you were fortunate that you had that insight. Um, I wanted to ask you about the spiritual journey. You you mentioned that 
I think during your marriage, right? You said you started kind of reaching out into the spiritual realm and yeah. reading about, you know, different authors and Eckhart Tolle and so on. Do you notice mm -hmm. a connection between um, doing that and then your journey to self-healing began after that? Do you think there was a connection for you? Yeah, because I think it kind of opened me up to the possibility of a higher level of thinking or even getting out of the thinking. I think the thinking can be what we need to get away from. Yes. You know, we need to get out of our head and into our heart. And that's what that helped me do. And what it really helped me with, because The Power of Now was one of those books that oh, I that read. Oh, that was such a great, that book changed me. It yes. really did. Yes. And the the thing about it that probably changed you, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's just this focus on the present moment instead of absolutely. The past and and the it's future. such a simple premise because we go through our lives every day and we never think about the now moment. And, you know, mm -hmm. he just kind of summarized everything that made total sense. And even till today, my mantra is, you know, focus on the now moment. So if I see myself getting mm -hmm. anxious about something or overthinking the past, I always pull myself back into the now. Yes, absolutely. Because, and that can help with anxiety as well. Yes. Like just focusing on now the grounding techniques we use to deal with um, a nervous system overload. That's all that is. You're just focusing on the now you're noticing what's around you. You're feeling the senses in your body. You might be feeling your feet on the ground or touching yourself to know that you're here. That's all just mindfulness, you know? Do you, re so, do you recommend yeah. that in your book? Um, like for folks to yes. go on this spiritual journey as well. So it's not all just like mind freak stuff. It's just like a connection between mind, body and spirit. Am I right? Yes. And I don't um, actually recommend any specific spiritual journey because I do like to welcome in all faith backgrounds and all mm -hmm. spiritual backgrounds. I think what I write applies to everyone so I don't want to limit it in that way but there is a definite Buddhist flair to all this stuff because mindfulness is a concept that started in Buddhism and that was brought to the west and that's why we are able to avail of it right and benefit from it and that is part of the self-compassion in fact that's the third component of it is um, mindfulness and in mindfulness yes paying attention to the present moment but especially accepting and not judging your feelings as they are right now. And because emotions can be very difficult for those mm -hmm. of us who had a rough childhood because they weren't supported. We didn't understand them. We were told they were bad. We were afraid of them. Um, so emotions are often something that we run away from. But as human beings, we are emotional and we cannot run away from our feelings forever. They catch up with us. And if you don't deal with them in a healthy way, they come out in very unhealthy ways. So you might be familiar, not you, but like anyone watching might be familiar with having outbursts if you tried to suppress your emotions for too long, mm -hmm. or maybe even just a feeling of going numb and feeling empty because you don't know how to express your emotions. So if you can get with those feelings and just feel them instead of pushing them away, and realize also that they are your friend too. Your emotions have things to tell you. Right. Your emotions are messengers that can actually improve your life. So this anger that especially women are so afraid of, this is your catalyst for change. This is what's telling you what's not working in your life. That's why you don't like it. You know, that's why it's making you upset because it's not working. So instead of trying to talk yourself out of the anger, look at what's causing the anger and see how you can start to make little changes that are going to improve that area of your life. And then something like sadness too is it is an opportunity to go within to really nurture yourself and care for yourself instead of saying, you know, snap out of it or giving yourself a pep talk. That's not really true. You know, where are you today um, in terms of your healing? 
do you find yourself ever expanding that and just constantly evolving in that or or do you mm-hmm. find yourself like okay this is where i'm at and i'm good yeah yeah no i think healing is a lifelong journey because i just love the process of self discovery and self awareness and that's why once you get the focus off other people and trying to please them and get it on yourself and realize that everything you need is inside of you, that even the euphoria that you might look for in a drug, you can get that from a breath meditation. You know, you can do a breath work session and feel so high that it's better than any drug that you could find, you know? So literally your breath is all you need to be happy. And just continually getting curious about yourself. And when your inner child is healing, one of the signs is that instead of feeling scared all the time or beating yourself up, you're curious about things. Mm. You're sort of like asking why. And you might be asking the same question. So when you're in your unhealed state, you might say, why did I do that? And then when you get into the curious, healthy state, you go, why did I do that? You know, and you really want to know why, like, because it's going to give you information so you can do it differently the next time. So constant, just, we are so so interesting. And and if you can just hold yourself in that space of like, I just want to know myself better. And the better we know ourselves, really, the better off the world is going to be. And I know there are some famous quotes around that. I don't have any at my disposal right now, but that really healing the self is the best way to heal the world. You know, well, I, I love what you just said about how you frame the two questions. So one is more mm-hmm. like a, you're blaming yourself and you're attacking yourself. And the other one is just, you really want to know for self-discovery, why did I do that? That is so mm-hmm. profound right there. I love that. Good. I'm glad. Yeah. Because Oliver, the first way is we're not really, we don't really want an answer. We just want to beat ourselves up. But the second way is you really want to know, you know, you're not wasting that moment. Right. Absolutely. I really, really, that was a good awakening right there. Um, Tell us a little bit about your coaching. So what exactly, Mm -hmm. and, and how can people reach out to you um, for coaching, because I think a lot of people are turning to coaching rather than going to, for psychotherapy or that type, like a more mm. structured, I think they just want the privacy of kind of doing it on their own with one person in a healing way, rather than like making an appointment with a shrink and being told you need medication. So right, what, how right. does coaching work and what do you do to help folks? Yeah, so my coaching program, you can do three or six month containers with me. And um, I call it turning the gaze within. So you can tell that I really want people to stop looking outward for their happiness and start looking inside of themselves. And I call it that mainly because my clients are coming from toxic family systems, where they've been trained to focus on other people and keeping Mm -hmm. other people happy And that has distracted them from knowing themselves and loving themselves. So we, in a very general sense, we just get back to get the focus off them, get the focus on yourself. Mm -hmm. We might deal with if people are looking for ways to find themselves within that system without feeling overwhelmed by these other people who are quite negative. And then we use the tools of self-compassion that I was talking about. But it really is the inner child healing that I was talking about. We do boundary setting. um, And with boundary setting, I don't believe in scripts. I believe in building the self-worth so that the boundaries come from a really natural place of just knowing what you will and won't tolerate. They, They just come out naturally because you've decided, no, I actually don't accept that anymore. That's not who I am anymore. So it's very transformative instead of behavior modification. And a lot of my clients, they have, I'd say all of them really have done therapy in the past and they're just looking for an addition to that or Mm -hmm. something different, you know, because it has been a lot of behavior modification. A lot of my clients might do it in tandem with therapy. 
Um, they might have been offered modalities like CBT, which is very based on the thoughts and the mind, which isn't necessarily right for someone who is just starting to deal with their trauma. Is that cognitive-based cognitive based therapy? Yeah. Just so folks cognitive know. Be- cognitive behavioral therapy, mm-hmm. and is very much based on the concept of changing your thoughts and you change your reality. And I'm not saying it's wrong. I just think there is a place for it that is not necessarily at the beginning of a trauma healing journey because healing trauma starts in the body. And a lot of that is stored in um, our nervous system. And Mm -hmm. we have to find ways to regulate our nervous system, regulate our emotions. And I believe from there, the thoughts will change. And also, I don't believe the CBT um, kind of, I don't know, the belief system that thoughts are not useful, because part of it is saying that thoughts not helpful, get rid of it. Mm. And I'm like, well, no, we don't get rid of anything. Because I've said, we're always on our own side, it just may not look like that sometimes. So that thought is there for you to get curious about. If you're you're having negative thoughts all the time, I don't believe the answer is to say that's not helpful, get rid of it. Because I don't believe that's being honest with yourself. I Mm. think the real helpful thing to do is look at that thought and say, why am I having this negative thought? Where does that come from? Where did I learn that coping mechanism? And often it starts in childhood where you were disappointed so often Mm. that preparing yourself for disappointment feels safer than expecting something good to happen. So if you refuse to look at that, how are you going to heal it? You know, but how do you, how do folks heal that? Because I notice even with a lot of my friends, they, they, their biggest problem is just constant worry and negative thoughts. That seems yeah. to be the biggest challenge for a lot of people to deal with. So you're saying mm-hmm. that healing comes like you heal your inner child and then that kind of mm-hmm. heals itself. Is, am I right? Yes, that's what I believe, because I don't believe that policing your thoughts works in the long term. I think it makes you feel fractured inside of yourself because you just think about the idea of policing your thoughts you're a policeman and your thoughts are something separate from you right but I believe all the parts of us are trying to help us they just don't know how Mm. so policing thoughts makes you feel like you're at war with yourself in my opinion this is my opinion and I believe kind of looking at the thoughts it's that mindfulness again the same way we look at feelings look at thoughts why is it there where did it come from and that's part of healing the inner child too and reassuring the child that oh I get it you're trying to protect me with these Mm -hmm. negative thoughts because you think I can't deal with disappointment but I'm an adult now and if things don't work out I can deal with it I'm not gonna die you know I can deal with it And so now that I know I can deal with disappointment, maybe I can expect something better too. I love that. That's brilliant. Um, Tell folks where, where they can get your book and reach out to you for coaching. Of course, we'll have your website running across the screen and stuff like that, but let folks know about your book. Where can they get it? Is it out yet? Yeah, it's available for pre-order. The official release date is September 12th. But if you go to my website, laurakconnell.com slash book, you will get, I put up a nice page where you can get all the details there. And when you click the link, it'll take you to Simon & Schuster, who is the bookseller. And I put it on my page there because I am offering a gift. If you buy the book and you send me a screenshot, I'm going to send you a gift, which is online. So anybody can get it anywhere in the world. And these are resources that I normally sell at a value of $99, but I'm going to give it to you if you buy the book and send me the screenshot. And the book's only $15.95, I think. So you'll get um, like six times the value if you- Wow, that's um, fantastic. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. I'll have that running across the screen as well. Laura, I can't thank you enough. That information was so- essential for folks to be able to learn about thank you so much for sharing you're welcome gems of information today is there anything you'd like to say in closing 
You know what? It's been such a pleasure being here with you. And I've just really enjoyed um, sharing what I think is an alternative view of how to heal self-sabotage. That's not so much tough love, but that is more about giving yourself compassion. Mm. So I think that's the one thing I'd like to stress. Tough love. You've had enough of being mean to yourself. Why don't you try something different? Being mean hasn't worked. Why don't you try being nice and see how that works? I love that. That's brilliant. Well, thank you again so much, Laura. And I hope to catch up with you again. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you.